Hey folks, John here, Old Takery Forge. Welcome back. If it's your first time here, welcome. Yes, I do still make videos. Uh, if you're wondering where I've been, you know, I've just been swamped with other work and this and that. But what's going on today, I'm out here in the workshop and we're finally getting moving on the Viking Challenge. So if you want to check it out, stick around. I really want to bring my A game to this challenge, so I'm going to be aiming high and attempting what's called a Serpent Core Multibar Viking Sword. If you don't know what that is, it's something along these lines in this book, Swords of the Viking Age by Ian Pierce. I'll also drop a link down below to a video from a gentleman by the name of Niels Provos, who did an excellent series recreating a Serpent Core Viking Sword. And I'm going to be taking a lot of the same steps he took. The main thing I'm going to be doing differently is the Serpent Core of the Sword. I'm going to be making that out of cable Damascus because the pattern kind of resembles snakeskin in my opinion, but essentially the way it works, we're going to forge weld those two pieces of cable into bars, forge weld them together because I don't think one's going to be enough, draw out the bar that's going to become our inner core, weld on two bars of 15 and 20. Normally people use mild steel for this, but the 15 and 20 will etch a little brighter and I just think will look better. Then we need to go ahead and cut away all this material and whenever we forge this flat, that's what creates the core of the sword. So, then, we need to weld on two bars of low-layer twist Damascus and two layers, or two bars, of mono steel 1084. All that needs to be forged welded together, so the whole sword is going to be made of seven bars. Then what we need to do is come in here and make a fish mouth cut and forge weld that together and something along these lines is what we should end up with. So, uh, you know, this is the most complicated and ambitious project I've ever undertaken. There's a lot of steps, a lot of forge welding, um, you know, every one of which could go wrong and completely destroy the sword. You know how I say there's nothing to it, really? Well, this time there is something to it. So let's get after it. First things first, we've gone ahead and welded up the ends so that it stays together for the forge welding process. First thing we'll need to do is forge weld the ends together so they're nice and solid. Then we'll twist it tighter at a welding heat and forge it out into a bar at a welding heat. You know, cable Damascus 101, nothing to it really. Obviously all the grease and crap on the cable is going to burn off when you put it in the forge. That's normal. Uh, there's lots of surface area so be generous with your plugs. cable welded up uh, now we'll just make another one so our first forge welding operation is done we got two bars of cable steel we're going to forge weld these together and draw it out into about a one inch square bar this is where it gets kind of complicated because this thing is too long to forge weld the whole thing at once and we're going to have to work in sections but we'll keep it hot keep it fluxed keep it brushed and it should come together just fine this billet here, uh, I couldn't get my hands on any square stock 15 and 20, so this is all just 15 and 20 flat bar. I'm going to forge weld this together and draw it out into a, a one inch square bar. You know, another to it really. So I'm just going to take my time, you know, working sections a little bit at a time. Don't try to go too far too fast, and hopefully it holds. started with way more material than I needed, but I mean, that's okay. I'd rather have and not want than what and not have. Alrighty, so we had a bit of an issue with the power hammer. That tire is supposed to be sitting straight up, and it looks like the drive shaft is broken or something of that, so I'm going to do what I can to try to fix it, but I, I doubt this is something that I can fix. You know, we'll see what happens. 
Luckily, we got the forge press, so we'll keep moving. Spoiler alert, I wasn't able to fix the power hammer. That spindle axle up top that the tire actually spins on is, you know, very, very broken. Big shout out to Dave Custer and the boys at Fiery Furnace Forge, though. You know, I showed him what happened, and he's sending me every single piece and part that I need to fix it, as well as directions on how to do it at no cost to me. So that's, you know, that's stand to buy your product. If you're in the market for an entry-level power hammer, there's no better place to spend your money, in my opinion. But anyway... Let's keep moving. Our next forge welding operation is going to be combining these two bars of our 15 and 20 that we just made along with our cable core that's going to become our serpent. Before we can forge weld them together, we need to grind them flat and square and everything. As you can see here on the end, some of them are kind of rhombus and everything. And if we try to press that together, uh, they might kind of want to slide apart. So we really need to take our time and grind these things as flat and straight and square as possible before we try to forge weld them together. Alrighty, well, that took freaking forever. We got our three bars forge welded together, our cable core and the 15 and 20 on either side. And then I've made staggered cutouts all the way up and down the bar. And now the idea is that when we press this flat, the core is going to shift side to side. And that's what's going to make the serpent pattern we're looking for. We're asking a lot of the forge welds here, so, uh, you know, wish me luck. The next thing we need to make is two billets of a low layer, high twist pattern Damascus. So right here, I've got 32 layers stacked up, probably way more material than I need, but I'd rather have and not want than want and not have. We'll forge weld this together, draw it out into about a one inch square bar, do the twists, and that should leave us enough material to grind it back down to square to match up with the thickness of this. It's about three quarters of an inch. The serpent core bar is looking really, really good. I'm very happy with how all the forge welds came up. Pulling them that far, you're kind of asking a lot of the welds and you know, they didn't come apart, so that's pretty cool. So as I was forging out that big billet, uh, it got pretty heavy and unwieldy pretty fast as it got longer. So I stopped, cut it in half, welded on some new work pegs, and we'll dry each of these bad boys out into our one inch square bar. All right, so after getting my laminate bars to one inch square, I didn't quite have the length I was looking for, so we're adjusting fire a little bit. What I've done is I've forged them into an octagonal cross section, and then what I'm going to do is let these cool, and I'm going to take them to the grinder and grind them as close to round as I can. That way, whenever I twist it, hopefully we don't make any cold shuts, and from there we can just forge it out into a three-quarter inch square bar, and that'll give us the thickness we need. If you're into artwork, I'll link Julie's Instagram down below in the description. Here's a pretty cool piece she made for me as a gift. It's a photo of one of my favorite places to go hiking, you know, painted on a saw blade. It hangs up in our house. Pretty stinking cool. All right, so we got our twist pattern bars forged out to three quarter inch square. They're reasonably straight. We got enough there to grind everything flat and marry it all up real nice before we go in for the next forge weld. We also got some excess down here, which is cool. We're definitely gonna be saving that and making a knife out of that in the near future. 
The next step is to make up a billet of solid square bar 1084. I looked around trying to find three quarter inch square 1084, but I couldn't seem to find any. So we're gonna stack up a billet just like we did with a 15 and 20 for our serpent core. Make a big bar of that and go from there. All right, so we got all our bars drawn out to approximately three quarter inch square. We have our serpent core in the middle, our twisted Damascus on either side, and our 1084 that's gonna become the cutting edge. We gotta trim this one down a little bit, but that won't take but a minute. Next thing I'm gonna do is run each bar through the forge one more time and use uh, some angle iron in my vise just to try to get everything as straight as possible so that when I start grinding, I don't have to remove so much material. And hopefully we got good surfaces for the forge weld and everything. This is the most important forge weld of the whole project. If this goes wrong, you know, we're basically screwed and we're gonna have to do something else because I don't have time to make up another one of these. So uh, let's get after it. This is probably the most difficult forge weld I've ever attempted. It doesn't help that this billet probably weighs like 30 pounds. I aimed way, way too high with how much material I'm using. Um, and as you saw, as we started to forge weld at the end, we had a problem with the bars separating at the back. I kind of figured that was going to happen. I had to clamp these pretty tight to tack them together. Uh, you know, they're constantly wanting to come apart, but the more and more we get forge welded, the better and better it will stay together. And that first press felt really, really good. So we're just going to take our time. Lots of flux, lots of heat, and hopefully get this thing stuck together. Alrighty, well, that, uh, that took some doing. I'm pretty confident we have the weld set all the way up and down. It looks good. It's feeling good. It's behaving as one piece of material. There's way, way too much here, though. Starting with three quarter inch bars was just stupid. If I ever do this again, I'll use half inch or three eighths bars because there's enough here to make at least two swords. So the first thing we're going to do tomorrow is actually cut this thing in half and start forging out a blade. So it's the next day. We got half of our billet. Got a work peg welded on. It's ready to go. Forge welds are looking pretty stinking good. There's a few little slag inclusions in the cable core, but that doesn't surprise me because that's, you know, such a dirty forge weld. But here's where we need to start thinking about the dimensions of the finished blade because we have such a finite amount of edge steel on either side. We can't just forge this out into a bar and grind the sword out of it. We need to get it pretty close to the width of the finished blade, so I'm going to bring it in to about two and a half inches. And right now it's about three quarters of an inch thick, so it needs to come that way quite a bit. And I want to keep it, you know, on the thick side because we still got to go in for the fish mouth weld so that our edge steel comes all the way up to the top. So we're not out of the woods yet, but uh, hopefully the worst part's over. And the final forge weld before this is actually ready to be made into a sword is we got to do a pie cut from the ends here and then forge weld all this together so that our edge steel comes all the way to the end and all the way to the point of the sword. You get the idea. So the forge weld on the tip fought me a tiny bit, but I do believe we got it set. So the next thing we have to worry about is forging in the overall profile of the sword. We can't just forge this whole thing out or do a bar and then grind the sword out of it because we have a finite amount of edge material. So what we need to do is, you know, tentatively forge in the profile of the blade, thin it out and everything. So that's what's happening now.
after that last bit of forging, we got the blade blank roughly cut out. Right now we're sitting at 34 inches of blade, which is on the big side, historically speaking. You know, it's not unheard of. Some late Viking swords with blades as long as 40 inches have been found. So this definitely isn't unheard of, but it is on the big side for a single-handed sword. It's just a little bit too narrow down here at the bottom of the blade. I'd like it to be about two and a quarter inches. So the next thing we gotta do is do a little bit of hand beveling down here on like the bottom half of the blade. Other than that, the taper's looking really, really good. Quick little sidebar from the sword project to get the power hammer back up and running. You know, huge shout out to Dave Custer and the boys at Fiery Furnace Forge. They sent me the new part I needed as well as a bunch of detailed videos explaining how to do it. Also, shout out to my buddy Andrew of WNC Metalworks. You know, he's a much better welder than me. He's actually got the skills and machinery to put this thing back together. So uh, hopefully we don't have any more problems. Alrighty, fellas. So I spent a little bit of time in front of the grinder, just thinning the whole thing down, making it as close to flat and even as I could. The edges were also different thicknesses all the way up and down from where I was doing that forging to widen the blade. So I went ahead and roughed in some bevels to even all that up. It's still very, very thick. It's probably about twice as heavy as the finished sword is going to be. So hopefully we don't have any problems like warping or cracking during the heat treating because everything's still nice and thick. We got the sword forge pulled out. We're going to normalize this bad boy a few times and get it quenched. Pass the blade in and out of the fire nice and slow over the whole length so it heats up nice and even. I've already normalized this thing three times uh, using the same technique. So once we get enough to heat this time, we're going to be going into the quench. So wish me luck. the next day we're about to get moving on tempering the sword it was pretty late last night by the time I got done with everything I needed to do in the shop and once you start you can't really stop till you're done so I didn't get to it but I did want to show you guys real quick we got the power hammer put back together and uh, up and running flawlessly I know I've said it a bunch of times but a huge huge shout out to Dave Custer and the boys at Fiery Furnace Forge the spindle axle breaking is just kind of a freak accident. It has nothing to do with bad craftsmanship or bad design, so it wasn't their fault. And nonetheless, uh, they stood by it. They sent me the part I needed to fix it right away at no cost to me. Detailed instructions on exactly how to do it. And Dave even told me that if I had to pay to have it welded back on, to send him the invoice. So, you know, honesty and integrity like that is just something you don't see a lot these days in the business world anymore. You know, that's... That's how you stand by your product. So if you're um, in the market for an entry-level power hammer, there's no better place in the world to spend your money. To temper the sword, we're gonna be doing a hot oil bath. Last time I did this with the Katana project, I set the whole container up on a uh, turkey fryer, and it didn't really bring the oil up to the heat I wanted, and I ended up having to use this torch, so that's just what I'm doing now. I got a thermo couple with the probe down in the oil. We're gonna heat it up to about 400, 425 or so, and hold it there for about an hour and a half. You get the idea. Using the weed burning torch really is the way to go doing this. You know, this got it up to heat much, much faster than using that turkey fryer did on my last sword project. Uh, basically, I'm just kind of blasting it with the torch until we get it to about 450 and then turning it off. And the oil holds that heat for quite a while. So I'm just going to keep an eye on the thermocouple. I'm trying to keep it between 400 and 450 for the whole hour and a half. It's a little bit warm right now, but it's not going to hurt anything. You get the idea. So we did pick up a teeny tiny bit of a warp during the quench, unfortunately, but, um, you know, that's something we know how to fix. So we got the blade clamped straight, so I'm going to be doing a torch temper. Normally when you see me do this, I'll heat up the center of the blade and use a spray bottle to keep the edges cool. But after the quench and the temper cycle, all I really did was strike in the fuller so I could see the colors. The edges are still very, very thick, so I'm not too terribly worried about overheating them. So we'll just put some heat into the center of the blade, move the clamps out of our way up and down as we go, and uh, hopefully that straightens it. So 
So after doing the torch temper on both sides of the blade all the way up and down, we've got pretty much all the warp out. You know, it's not perfect. There's still some little waves in the edge, but that was already there from the unevenness of the rough grinding I did before heat treating. So now we're well within range of what we can fix on the grinder. So the next thing we're going to do is, you know, hit the grinder. We got to get the fuller all the way done to its finished thickness and everything before we start doing the bevels. Uh, but that's really all there is to it. So we got the fuller ground into the sword. You know, it still needs to be polished out and cleaned up and everything, but all the heavy material removal is done. I ended up switching from a six inch contact wheel to a four inch because it made it easier to get in here into the deep central parts of the fuller and make it, you know, nice and thin without sacrificing our edge material. The reason we want our fuller to be pretty much all the way done before we start doing our bevels, as you can see here and here, where I've ran up over that edge with my contact wheel, now we have lots of thickness and lots of material to play with to fix that, whereas if we did the bevels first, you know, we wouldn't have room to fix it and everything. Also, as we start removing material and, you know, refining the distal taper of the sword, because it's still pretty much all the same thickness, the lines are going to kind of taper their way up and kind of follow the fuller as we refine the bevels. And if we did the bevels and the taper and everything first and then ground in the fuller, it would just all be the same thickness and it just wouldn't look right and the lines wouldn't flow. A question I know I'm going to get is, you know, why didn't you forge in the fuller? Why did you just grind in the fuller? Well, one, it's faster. Uh, you get a much cleaner result. And also because this is multi-bar construction, had I forged in the fuller, it would have spread everything all out of whack and it just really wouldn't have looked very good. You know, there's some instances, like if you're doing a wrought iron core, in which you do need to forge in your fuller, but for something like this, it needs to be ground in. So we're moving right along, uh, grinding on this blade. It's thinning out real nice. It's lightening up really good. Right now it's sitting at two pounds, eight ounces. I'd like the finished sword fittings and all to be under three and a half pounds. And uh, we've still got quite a bit of material to remove along the cutting edges and some of the tang to trim off. So we should have no problem hitting that goal weight. You can kind of see now that the sword is starting to take shape what I was talking about as to why you need to do the fuller first. Um, I don't know how well you can see it on camera. But as we grind in our bevels and refine the distal taper of the sword and everything, the width of the fuller is naturally going to taper as we go up the blade. Whereas if we did the bevels and the taper first and then tried to grind in the fuller, it would just all be kind of the same width all the way up and down and it just, uh, it wouldn't look good in my opinion. Another important thing to remember when you're doing swords, as they get thinner they get very, very flexible. So you need to be careful not to push too hard into the platen of your grinder and bend the sword around it and have the edges of your belt dig in and everything. So, uh, you know, it's slow going, but we're getting there. So we got all the rough grinding done on the blade. I've polished it out with some Scotch-Brite belts just a little bit. So it's, uh, you know, it's not done, but it's ready for hand sanding. Right now, the weight is sitting at 1 pound, 13 ounces. And now it's time for the infamous flex test. So the idea is we should be able to flex the sword, you know, to at least 45 degrees or so, either side, without it taking any set, and obviously without it breaking, so uh, that blade's still dead straight. So we're good to go, boys. So I've been going through the book trying to find which style of hilt that I like best, and I think this is the one I'm going to go with, with the uh, straight cross guard and this kind of dome-shaped pommel. I do kind of wish the book wouldn't use these backwards European measurements, like 10.2 centimeters. I have no idea what that is, so I typed it in on Google, and I found out that it's approximately 23-30 seconds the same width as a McDonald's hamburger. And that gives me kind of a rough idea of how wide the guard actually needs to be. You know, the metric system is the tool of the devil, so I ain't about to use it. So what we got here is some 2-inch round mild steel from the Great Blade Show Blunder of 2022. And we'll forge it out into about an inch square. All right, so we got that bit of mild steel forged out into some square bar. We got the piece we're going to be using to make the guard here. I've drilled a couple of guide holes that are uh, about the same width as the tang. This is where a milling machine would be really, really nice to have, but we don't got one, so we're going to hot punch that sucker. So we got our initial rectangular hole punched into the piece that's going to become our guard. It's fitting the sword pretty stinking well. 
So the next thing we need to do is make another punch that uh, has the same shape as the uh, bottom of the sword and then punch that partially through the guard so that whenever we assemble the sword, the shoulders of the tang and everything are going to be recessed into the guard because that'll just, you know, look much, much nicer. So that's what's happening now. So here's the tool we made for punching in the recess on the guard. This is all just mild steel. I don't reasonably expect to get more than one guard out of something like this, and it only took like 10 minutes to make, so it's not a big deal. But anyway, we'll heat the piece that's going to become the guard up, and we'll drive this guy in from the top, and uh, this matches the dimensions of the sword pretty stinking closely, so hopefully after that's done, it'll all fit nice and snug. So we got our guard shaped out. Next thing to do is go ahead and move on to the pommel. It's going to be a pretty similar operation. We're just going to forge up a block of mild steel, drill a couple of guide holes and punch out a hole and try to drift it as close to the shape of the tang as we can. And then we'll go ahead and get the handle made as well. I want to get all the working components of the sword done so that I can really take my time on the, uh, the decorations on the guard and the pommel, which I'm still not entirely sure what I'm going to do. But anyway, let's make a pommel. So we got our pommel piece slot punched. It's fitting the tank pretty good right where I want it nice and tight and everything So the next step is just to hit the grinder and shape out a pommel So we got the fittings for the sword roughed out. They're obviously not done. They'll still need to be decorated and finished out and all that. But I want to go ahead and get all the working components of the sword done so I can really take my time with the decoration because I'm still not entirely sure how it is I want to do it. So the next thing we're going to do is go ahead and get the handle made. We got a real pretty piece of 5,000 year old bog oak we're going to be using for that. The weight of the sword right now is sitting at 2 pounds, 3.5, 3.6 ounces. The handle's going to add a little bit, but we also have a little bit of tang to trim off, so that's probably right about where the finished sword is going to end up. Alrighty, we got our block drilled out, broached out, time to shape it out. Alright, so we got the bog oak handle shaped out, sanded up, it's looking good, it's feeling good. I've gone ahead and polished out the fittings a little bit using the scotch Bright belt. Next thing we got to do is take the Dremel and uh, do our decorative carving. So here's the decorations we got on the guard and the pommel. You know, nothing too, too elaborate. There's not a whole lot I can do with just a Dremel tool and my current skill level. Engraving is something whenever I've got the time and money to throw at developing the skill. It's something I would really like to get good at. Uh, but now the sword is, you know, just about ready to be put together. Next thing we're going to do, go ahead and get it taken apart. Uh, get the blade cleaned up and into the acid bath. And then we're going to do a hot brush and a cold brush on these to get a nice soft gray. All that's left after that is to sharpen it. Cut off the excess, paint that boy over, and we got a sword. Here's what we got out of the etch. You know, you can see our serpent core, our two twist Damascus bars, and our solid 1084 edge bar. Pretty stinking sweet. So we got the cold peening done, the sword's put together, and our final weight is two pounds, seven and a half ounces. He's good and sharp, all the way up and down on both sides. But let's try it out on something a little tougher than a piece of paper. Right, so I got my shield uh, just in case this watermelon tries to pull a fast one on me. I'm actually a bit scared to swing this thing really hard because of how light it is. But anyway, let's give it a go. 
Okay. <laughs> yeah. Let's try a backhand swing now. Wow. <laughs> There we go. For my first attempt at a serpent core sword and also my first attempt at any kind of multi-bar construction overall, I'm pretty stinking happy with this thing. The blade is 33 and a half inches, overall length is 40 and a half inches, final weight is 2 pounds 7.5 ounces, balance point is right about there. So just um, you know maybe four and a half inches in front of the guard. So that's pretty cool. Uh, like I said, overall, I'm very, very happy with the sword, but I did learn a lot through this process, and there is quite a few things I would do differently if I was to do this again. Throughout this project, I learned a lot about how to make a serpent core sword, and I also learned a lot about how not to make a serpent core sword. Don't get me wrong, it's a beautiful sword. I'm happy with it. I'm proud of it. It's definitely some of my best work so far. But with everything I learned throughout this project, I already think I can do better. So I took the liberty of writing down some, uh, some mistakes I made in my high-speed little notebook. So if this is a project you're thinking of attempting, hopefully you can learn something from this. Uh, first thing, the cable Damascus core, that was a dumb idea. Uh, I was hoping it would mimic the look of snake skin, but with how much it's been squished up and drawn out and everything, it just, it kind of looks more like wrought iron now. My original plan was to use ball bearing Damascus, which I, I wish I would have done because it would have looked a lot more like snake skin than what I got now. So something like that, or even just using wrought iron, or like a billet of low layer Damascus with the seams turned up or something like that, it would have it would have looked much better. Uh, the 15 and 20 outer core, that was a dumb idea. The, the contrast is really nowhere near as bold as I thought it was going to be. Mild steel would have produced pretty much the same effect. Would have been a lot easier to get my hands on because I wouldn't have had to make the square stock from scratch, so it would have saved me a lot of time and a lot of money. The bars of twist Damascus that we made for the inner edge are not twisted nearly enough. We should have twisted them at least twice as tight as we did. That could also have something to do with how much we drew the billet out, which is something I'm going to talk about on my next point. Next point, I used bars that were way, way too thick. The bars I used for my multi-bar forge weld were three quarters of an inch square, which is just way, way more material than we needed. You know, after we got it all forge welded up, we made the sword out of one half of the billet, and I've got enough here to make a whole other sword. And that's kind of the reason I think the pattern isn't quite what I wanted to be. The twist pattern and the serpent core have been stretched out so much. They just don't, they're not as bold as I would have liked them to be because of how far it was pressed out and everything. So uh, the biggest lesson that I took away from making this sword is you want your bars before you go in for your multi-bar forge weld to be as close to the finished dimensions of the sword as possible. So you don't have to do any drawing out. They need to be the full length and, you know, relatively close to the same thickness as the finished sword. Obviously, thicker bars are going to hold forge welding heat longer, so they're easier to forge weld together. There's less worry about them kind of crimping, if that makes sense. Uh, so if I was to do this again, I'd use half-inch or even three-eighths inch square bars that are the full length of the sword. So that's my entry for the 2024 YouTube Viking Challenge. I hope you liked the video. I hope you learned something. There will be links down in the description box below to all the participating channels, so be sure to go and check out their videos. Everybody really brought their A-game to this challenge, and there's some pretty stinking awesome stuff out there. There will also be a link to a Google Doc where you can vote for your favorite build, so be sure to watch all the videos before you vote. I actually don't think you can vote for me because I'm in the judging bracket on this one, so, you know, sorry. There will also be links to the websites of all the challenge sponsors, which are doing some really, really great things for the YouTube knife-making community. So be sure to check them out. Again, big thanks to Dennis Tyrell for spearheading the challenge and for inviting me. It's always a great honor. Big thanks to everyone who participated. If you're wondering what I'm going to do with this sword, you know, I've done charity raffles with previous challenge swords and knives and things like that. But I'm actually keeping this. Uh, this is going to go into my personal armory. I'm, you know, I finally own some of my own work, so that's pretty sweet. But that's all I got for you. If you like what you saw, like, share, subscribe, all that jazz. Always more cool stuff coming. And y'all take care.